Hi guys, as we all know, uh, the release of Three Kingdoms Total War is coming up and we've been getting more and more information from CA which have all been very nice. Uh, so I decided to put together a more in-depth information about the setting, the characters, and like the events. Um, just to be clear, I'm not trying to persuade anyone of their preference or saying that you must know or learn all these things to be able to play. Um, I'm just I just want to help out those who may be interested in gaining more information so that they can enjoy a greater sense of immersion. Okay, that's enough background talk. Let's uh, jump straight into it. Uh, before I start, do bear with me. This is my first time doing any of all this like recording and YouTube thing. Um, you'll notice the shitty mic as well. Uh, so please forgive any lack in quality or... Um, technology uh, should I say yeah <laughs> okay uh, so I, w I wanted to start this series with uh, Xia Hu Dun uh, I'm probably butchering that pronunciation it's been a while since I've studied Chinese um, but the biggest reason being is that he has he's one of the he has one of the biggest character changes between historical records and the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. So uh, I'm going to refer to him as XD from now on because, well, why the hell not? Before we delve deeper, a uh, brief background on the sources I'll be using. I'll be referring to the Sangotsu, or Records of the Three Kingdoms, which is a historical text that covers the history of the late Han Dynasty around 184 to 220 Common Era, and the Three Kingdoms period, which is between 220 to 280 Common Era. Uh, it was written by Chen Shu, who lived from 233 to 297, and consists of three compilations, namely the Book of Wei, the Book of Shu, and the Book of Wu. Uh, later on annotations were included by uh, Pei Songzhi, who is from actually the Song Dynasty much later down the line. Uh, the more frequently read Romance of the Three Kingdoms, uh, henceforth ROTK, was written by Luo Guanzhong and is a dramatization of Chen Shu's records. Uh, there are there's also a lot of interesting topics I can go over related to the authors themselves and their works, so let me know if you're interested and then I can go over those in another video. I'll first go over who he was uh, historically, then discuss his feats in ROTK. I'll also be discussing only career highlights, as that is what I want to introduce. So first, let's take a look at the poster provided by CA. He's got a pretty badass poster, he wears an eye patch, and is classified as a champion. His traits are hot-headed officer, hamstring, vengeance, and binding fury. So, why did CA go with these traits for this particular individual. Well, when XD was 14, he was studying under this teacher, right? And one day someone insulted his teacher. So XD went and killed that man at age 14. Now while it was and is outright murder, ancient China also had this culture of uh, chivalry. It likely was not in the exact same context as uh, medieval chivalry, which is what we often are referring to when we talk about chivalry, uh, but it was there. And anyways, XD had all the justification he needed to commit such an act. The more interesting thing to consider is, he killed someone even his teacher couldn't, not dared, def couldn't handle, right? I mean, like, if you think about it, the teacher was insulted, his pride and like his manliness perhaps challenged. Yet, it's XD who actually settles the score. I believe the reason this was included in the records was because this incident perhaps is meant to show that not only was he like upright from a very early age, but also likely reflects his personal perhaps martial prowess or his strength. Uh, anyhow, as time passes, Cao Cao, Cao decides he wants to try his luck at becoming the one to unify the land, and XD follows him. Why? Because the Cao and uh, Xiahu families are cousins. 
Right. And back then, blood was everything. Especially if you wanted to be a warlord and wanted to make sure internal fighting was kept either minimal or healthy and you wanted, you know, you wanted, to, you wanted loyal people around you first, right? That's how you got a solid foundation to work off. So XD definitely, uh, definitely followed Tussle around, uh, beating Yellow Turbans during the early rebellion stages and then later establishing a main holding from which to operate from and expanding their areas of influence and whatnot and so on. Provinces of the late Han Dynasty. If you look at the map in the center, you can see Yan Province. This is a very, very rough outline of the area today. That's the province where Tao Tao's main holding was located at Su Chang. In 193 CE, Tao Tao takes his main force and decides to head east to conquer another warlord that was holding that area. Um, at this time, XD was posted at Puyang. During this time, one of Tao Tao's semi vassal slash warlord and old friend decides to betray him and hand over the province to Lu Bu. Remember this guy from one of the earliest trailers? What would later come to be known as the Battle of Yan Province was possible because XD and some of Tao Tao's strategists who stayed behind managed to maintain a foothold in the region. It was during this battle XD came to lose his eye, giving him the trademark eye patch. Now, a direct hit by a fully fledged arrow to the eye results in instant death because your eye is rather squishy and the arrowhead is metal. The likely cause was a deflected and weakened arrow had struck the eye or he from like an odd angle or something or he was hit near the eye but infections and other complications caused him to lose sight in that eye. Either way, uh, the dramatized version of this is highly unlikely and I'll talk about that. Uh, in a brief moment. It also became his biggest source of an inferiority complex. This battle is also one of the greatest threats Cao Cao faced during his career and we can discuss that when we go into detail about Cao Cao. Uh, going back to the inferiority thing, see Xia Hu Yun, who is a cousin of XD, who also, and he also has a poster, uh, he was also serving under Cao Cao. And soldiers, you know, being the grunts, they needed to have a relatively more fun way to distinguish them, right? So, according to the Wei Liu, Xia Hu Dun's moniker within the ranks became Blind Xia Hu. Now, it being a battle scar and all, it probably wasn't meant to be an insulting moniker, but XD hated it all the same. So, did he take a few heads for it? Not at all, actually. The only victims of his anger, or countless mirrors, he said to he said to have broken a mirror every time he looked into one, because he just hated the way he looked. Uh, other accounts about his character also mention how he was very brave, courageous, but also surprisingly generous and understanding in very even in very emotional situations. So in the end, Cao Cao wins the Battle of Yan Province. He is able to retake back all his holdings. And there's, there's, there were probably a lot of changes internally. Um, there was a significant change for XD. Because some years after that, during the Battle of Guandu, which is the number one crisis. Not crisis, but like the, 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 the lowest point in Cao Cao's career. Right. During that time, XD was not in the front did not serve in the front lines, but rather he was back at the castles and like the holdings taking care of logistics and administration. In 215 CE, Cao Cao set out to conquer Zhang Lu, who was a warlord and religious leader who held Hanzong. Uh this is the Battle of Yangping Pass. Now this region, despite its seemingly remoteness, was a very important place at that time. And it's going to reappear many times throughout Three Kingdoms history because of its uh, very strategic location. Right? As it's got a lot of historical value to it as well. Anyways, 
Cao Cao's forces were attacking the enemy encampments on top of Yangping Mountain, but to no avail. So Cao Cao decided to circumvent the camp while keeping his rear safe, and so decides to first pull back all the troops. And so he sends out XD to collect the forces on the mountainside. Now, while doing so, it got dark, and XD and the, and the men that he gathered lost their way, and they accidentally stumbled onto the enemy's military camp. The enemy thought this was an ambush, and so they just frantically flee. They, they routed instantly. And it's even recorded in the actual like records that this was a very lucky win. Even, even they, you know, even XC had to send someone back and say, did, did we actually win? Did we just take this place that we've been fighting all day and could, couldn't conquer? It's, it's, uh, it's one of the more funny happenings during his career. But after this battle, there aren't a lot of noticeable records. XD did get lots of promotions, eventually making it to the position of Grand General or Imperator for a more understandable equivalent. He dies in 220 CE, uh, was said to have been a very frugal and upright man respected by many. Now, Wei had many, many talented generals whose merits far exceeded whatever XD had accomplished. Right. XD's merits in war pale in comparison to theirs. Yet, Cao Cao constantly gave important positions to XD. Why? There are three reasons. Blood ties, politics, logistics. You see, as the one who had the emperor in his pockets, Cao Cao's court was a mix of his retainers and those who served in the imperial court. This created many political strife between those loyal to Cao Cao and those who were more lying towards the emperor. Right. As such, there was always this danger people might become more loyal to the emperor and either try to oust him or provide enough justification for other warlords to gang up on him using the emperor's authority. Or, you know, there, there's a very... The emperor was still a very viable variable. Right. Although he's, you know, very powerless, um, and he's got little to none practical power, he's, he's just a puppet and whatnot, but still, the, his, his position and the, the fact that you can do whatever you want and put in the name of the emperor at the end of it, you know, gives you a lot of significant operating freedom, right? It's a very political calculation or political maneuver that Cao Cao decided to make the emperor his puppet and did, did it before anyone else could. Anyhow, so what Cao Cao needs is someone who he could trust to be loyal, someone who was generally respected and could attract away the loyalty that might have gone to the emperor to his camp or his flag. And also, having blood relatives hold key positions is never a bad thing for a warlord. It solidifies his control over his retainers, and it also boosts organization. Lastly, as Napoleon said, an army marches on its stomach. Even today, and especially more back then, the task of handling logistics is, was no lowly job. Rather, it could determine the fate of the expeditionary force or even the entire warlord's force in general. XD was said to have kept a scholar in his camp at all times and constantly studied. So from that we can kind of infer that perhaps he was more capable in politics or administration. So to wrap it up, historically XD was more of a chief of staff figure. He's the type that makes sure all the generals on the front lines are getting what they need to fight effectively and just supports them from behind, right? So then how was he portrayed in the novel? Well, let's go back to the eye thing I mentioned above. In the novel, XD is struck in the eye by an arrow, like a direct hit. He doesn't die. Rather, he pulls the arrow with the eyeball attached out of his eye. He looks at it. He says, This is also made of my father's essence and my father, mother's blood. How dare I treat it with disregard? And he proceeds to eat the eye. Pretty badass, right? 
Also, remember how I mentioned there's not a lot of records of him serving on the front lines, right? In the novel, however, this guy is one of the contending 1v1 pros. He's, he's, a, he's a top duelist. He's like the strong arm of the evil lord Cao Cao. During a battle against Dong Zhou, XD cuts down a pretty strong general under Dong Zhou. Um, I'm purposefully being a bit lazy about the names because... Reasons. I'll try better next time, I promise. <laughs> He's, he also exchanged over 40 blows with Gao Shun, who was also a famous general and fighter under Lu Bu during the Battle of Yan Province. And in the novel, during this 1v1, one of Lu Bu's men fires a surprise arrow which hits XD in the eye, and he then proceeds to eat it. He also exchanges scores of blows with Guan Yu. Now, to put it into context, Guan Yu was literally called a god of war by both friend and foe. Like, this guy was the shit when it came to, whatever, 1v1... You know, general strategy, martial prowess, leadership. You know, he's like the, he's like an embodiment of war, right? This ended in a draw, though, because Zhang Liao eventually came and broke up the fight. He's also shown falling into a trap laid by Zhao Yun as he pursues Zhao Yun without caution when Cao Cao, Cao, Cao uh, goes south to confront Liu Bei and you know, try and unify the lands because he's already he's already controlling all of the northern areas. All he needs is like the far west corners and the southern areas. Uh, we we can delve more into that in another video. Um, so compared to actual records in the novel, he's more a frontline figure, getting into one v ones, exhibiting feats of bravery and prowess, and I think this is what CA really went off on. I mean, as we all know, administration and infrastructure, they don't really play a big part in total war games, right? Uh, it's, it's, it all boils down to the battles. And so, basing your characters off of more active portrayals kind of makes sense. But at the same time, I, th I think that, you know, maybe if they had incorporated some of his more historical... Um, traits of you know like maybe in terms of upkeep or like um, replenishment rates that would have been also nice rather than this kind of binding fury it almost sounds like a mad druid right anyways so yeah that was some insight into Shahodun. Um not sure what do you guys think <laughs> I was, I'm still a little nervous after this, um, but please leave any thoughts, comments, or feedback below or who you'd like me to talk about next. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.